Okay, so welcome to everybody, to all of the Interested Perspective PhD students, and I um, look forward to just telling you a little bit about research in the area of musculoskeletal disorders and ageing, which is centred around the School of Allied Health, which is part of the Education and Health Sciences faculty in the university. And so we're a faculty with a suite of health sciences, including the Allied Health, of which I am part. So I am discipline lead for physiotherapy. We also have occupational therapy, uh, speech and language therapy, and human nutrition and dietetics within our school. More closely aligned with these schools of nursing and midwifery and with the graduate entry medical school in terms of our, our research. I am part of the Health Research Institute and the research centre within that, that uh, is the one that I am one of the, the lead members of, is the Ageing Research Centre. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that uh, research centre today, the kind of work that we do, and then also more specifically about some of the PhD students that I have working with me. So I'm a specialist physiotherapist. Um, my interest is in musculoskeletal disorders and chronic pain. And so I have a particular interest in, in shoulder pain and, and sort of neck pain, but any sort of area of musculoskeletal pain I'm interested in, in researching in. And I'm very passionate in particular about supporting effective low risk, low cost care for people with musculoskeletal disorders in their own communities. So people with these are people with, with any kind of painful joint or muscular disorders, these are things that are not going to uh, end their life, but they're going to give them very significantly poorer quality of life uh, and lead to long-term disability and high costs for healthcare, high costs for society um, for people with these conditions. I like all kinds of mixed and methods research, and I have developed a particular interest in knowledge translation in the last three to four years, and that's really about the understanding that while we, we have very good evidence for what we do in this area of care, very often clinicians don't have either access to that evidence or don't have the understanding that allows them to apply that evidence in practice. So the application of evidence in practice is something that I think is key to any kind of healthcare research. And uh, it's part of the, the PhD structure that I use is that students are encouraged either to have that as a core part or at least... Um, an add-on part of their PhD where they really look at how they're going to translate that information through to clinicians and through to the public. My favourite thing about being a researcher is, is my work with PhD students and hopefully most PhD supervisors will agree that it is something very, very fulfilling to watch PhD students flourish throughout their three to four years with us. Um, I'm, I'm someone who's very mindful of the different life challenges that students bring because I did my own PhD while I was working full time. So I do have students who are part time, full time, still working with young families. So I think it's, it's part of the supervisor's role to really help students find that balance while they're succeeding in their PhD. I genuinely believe anyone who wants to succeed in a PhD can. And there are lots of different pathways in which you can do that. But I think there are some key considerations if you're not taking this a standard full time four year out of university route to your PhD and I think your supervisor does need to understand that and and support you in that and, and that's something that's something that I'm quite conscious of as a, a supervisor I think. So these are the people uh, who are with me in the Aging Research Centre. We are a multidisciplinary group uh, so we have uh, a number of health professionals so OTs, physios, uh, nurses. We also have some statisticians and mathematicians. We have Richardson from the technology from Lero so she brings very strongly the health technology side of things to the group and we have a, a people who are you know involved in a wide range of methods and also including Hil Hilary Moss who comes from an arts practice music and arts therapy background. Our key themes for the centre are about ageing in place, so helping people to supporting healthy ageing for people in the communities in their homes. Health analytics is one of our work packages and we're really interested in looking at how we can use data to um, help us understand ageing better and help us understand how illnesses and, and, and different disabilities affect people as they age. And we, we focus a lot on what's called the, the TILDA data set, so the, a data set of, of over 8,000 uh, older people in Ireland, which has been running um, for almost 10 years now. Um, and we've used a lot of data from that particular data set to help us understand the experience of older people uh, in Ireland. We're interested in aligning health services to the needs of older people. And we have some big projects, Rose Galvin in particular, with the university hospitals around older people's pathway through emergency care and also then how they can be supported in their communities after they've had an episode of acute care in the hospital.
And I mentioned Ida Richardson, Associate Professor from Lero, and she's very interested in technology and older people. So a lot of the projects, we try and ensure that we embed some degree of technology in there that actually helps support the projects and, again, makes them kind of more sustainable so that when we've finished our input, often technology can take over to some degree in, in, in helping to continue the benefits of the project. And that's really only a snapshot. So we do have our uh, video of, of what we've been doing over the last couple of years. Some of the projects that we've been involved in are really across the continuum of older people's care. So as part of that, you know, we're really interested in, in working with PhD students in terms of the, the most traditional areas of, of funding and also occasionally within the centre, we do have opportunities for um, specific funding. We don't have any PhD scholarships right now at the present time, but I think um, keep an eye on, on our website and keep in touch with us um, because we really want to speak to students who are interested in older people's care because um, we do feel that you know, we can engage you in, in something meaningful if, if you have those interests. Just a broader question, I, it interests me to, to think about what sort of questions you should be asking as a PhD student. And I think it's really important to think about why you want to do a PhD. And maybe I'm just coming at that from the clinician's perspective uh, very much. But, you know, often a PhD may or may not actually contribute hugely to your career development. But I think if you choose the right project, the right uh, supervision, build the right skills across your project, then it can certainly contribute to your career. And, and so it's important to think in advance, well, you know, why am I doing it and what can it contribute to to my career? Because in, in clinical practice, it isn't as obvious, again, how a PhD may contribute. And, and I think if you build that in from the start, it makes it a much more meaningful experience. So thinking about the skills that you have and what you want to develop and what's valuable to you, because you're spending a long time on this. Um, you need to be passionate about it and therefore, you know, the, the experiences that are valuable to you are what should be forming, you know, the, the, the main part of your PhD. I think, as I said, I've got students who have all different kinds of backgrounds and the academic financial commitment has to be strongly considered. That doesn't, shouldn't be a token thing. Um, you really should plan that out from the beginning. Think about who your support system is going to be, both financial and and, and social and personal and academic because we want you to be set up to succeed and certainly not to, to, to have it as an enormous struggle. And the more prepared you are at the beginning, absolutely the better students progress through. Um, managing your work-life balance, again, has to be thought out. And, and sometimes people who are doing the PhDs part-time along with work do need to take blocks of time where they can focus. Uh, and that could be, you know, taking a career break at some point during the four years. It could be getting some study leave. But it will be important to think about your employment and how you'll manage the work-life balance and how you will actually get some focused time. And you can plan that within the project is, look, this period, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not having to have huge focus. I'm mainly reading or writing. And another period of data collection, you may need strong focus on the PhD and therefore you may need some time out from work. But planning that in early is what really helps to make sure it's, it's, it's all successful. Other key elements, I suppose, for me uh, in a PhD would be, you know, really ensuring that you have the right project for each student. So for someone who's undertaking, you know, part-time PhD, where they may be thinking about coming in and out of, of periods of focused time, then running a, you know, clinical trial that requires, uh, you know, focused data collection over an 18 months to two year period probably isn't the right project. It might be more suitable to take a project that has, you know, set work packages that you can complete one, move on to the next uh, and complete that and at least have have blocks of, of, of project completed right through. So every project doesn't suit every student. And I think that's important to think about. I really value academic writing from the beginning. My PhD students undertake a writing group together on kind of every two months. They, they meet together as a, a group to actually write together, um, even though their topics aren't all exactly the same or, or some of them are closely aligned. Just uh, PhD students at different stages meeting together to talk about writing and to do writing together has been enormously valuable. Um, engaging with the research group. So PhD students within the Aging Research Centre attend the research group meetings. They present their, before they do their progressions, they present to the group if they're heading to a conference or writing a paper. They would also often present that to the group for feedback. And they're involved when we're doing uh, grant writing and so on so that they get to see the process of what happens within a research group. And, and that's important to us. So for a long-term research career planning and, and just getting on to career planning, Again, I'm a big believer in the Vitae framework, probably already been described, that the, the, the graduate school in UL really espouses that framework of using 
it to uh, look at what skills you have, what skills you want to develop and actually developing a kind of career development plan for yourself with your supervisor. So that's, uh, again, very important to to continue that through your PhD and the portfolio that you complete as part of your structured PhD is a real help. But linking that to uh, a career development framework is even more meaningful. I encourage all my PhD students to have some degree of an international experience and there are various scholarships available to help you do that. The Erasmus Plus is one of them. So PhD students can take a three month Erasmus funded scholarship you know, within the Erasmus Plus range of countries. I've had students who've travelled to Canada on the James O'Flaherty Scholarship. So there are various scholarships available that you can apply for through your PhD and you may have that funded through your funding. But it's, I think it's very important to have an international focus, help you to build the networks, but also to see how research works in other countries. So, yeah, I would, I would strongly encourage all my students to have at least some degree of an international experience if that's feasible. Also having international supervisors is something that is fun for me so that you, you, we have an external co-supervisor again that, that may be international, which brings that um, broader focus. And finally, I would encourage my students to do an, an article based thesis. Now, again, in the strictest sense of the word, UL uses a, a variety of, of models of thesis, but in uh, health sciences, we do strongly encourage students to write their thesis up as a series of papers three to five of you know somewhere between three to five of which would be published before they set their their final viva and clearly that allows you to finish your phd with some papers under your belt you learn a lot about writing academic writing from submitting and and revising papers for for publication so that's that's another area that's key so those are the kind of the, the, the key tenants of, of a phd with me so the students kind of know what they're getting and my colleagues uh, within the aging research center would have sort of similar views on on the way that they would a PhD. I'm not going to talk about all my PhD students. I have sort of five UL ones and, and one outside of UL at the moment. But I'm just going to give you some broad examples of, of IRC funded students that I have at the moment. So IRC is the main source of funding for, for my students. And again, I'm sure that's something that's been discussed with you this morning. So Christina Maxwell is an example of a clinician who's sort of um, 10 years qualified uh, after her undergrad and has come back to do her PhD was really thrilled to be successful with the IRC uh, funding award for her, her PhD scholarship. She's looking at stakeholder perspectives in, in, to explore implementing evidence-based practice in shoulder pain in particular, but in the broader idea of how do we actually work with stakeholders to, to help them apply evidence in practice. And she has a, an international experience planned in Canada um, next year. So she's traveling to Canada for two months to, to work with a colleague of mine over there. Uh, John Hurley's a, a PhD student who got a, an IRC PhD award as a new graduate. So straight away, pretty much after he graduated, he was awarded the IRC PhD scholarship. And again, is, is working uh, on, on therapeutic alliance in musculoskeletal practice. So again, I guess a strongly uh, a mixed, uh, mixed methods projects with qualitative and quantitative elements in terms of developing a new outcome measure. And John is in the last years of his PhD and is, is concurrently working as a, a teaching assistant in the department. And Lorna is someone I co-supervise with the um, P in sports science department. And just interestingly, she's she's funded through the IRC employment based scheme. So she's employed with Swim Ireland and they pay part of her scholarship and the IRC pay the other part of the scholarship. And her work, therefore, and her research is strongly embedded in the, the PhD that she's doing. So just different examples, different kinds of ways of getting funded, but also, you know, students with quite different experiences. The forthcoming projects that I have happening are an, an IRC New Foundations Award, where we're looking to enable older people with persistent pain to engage in exercise in the community. And that's partnered with Chronic Pain Ireland and Limerick Sports Partnership. There is no PhD funding in that project, but again, it's the kind of work that could easily be followed through as a PhD project in the future. Um, and again, if it's something that people are interested in, I will be having a research assistant post on that project. The second one that's starting in the next short while is a clinician scientist award with a, a postdoc called Dr. Helen O'Leary. And we're looking at, again, evidence-based treatment for um, knee, tears of the knee cartilage. Uh, and we're working with GPs to help them support patients to choose non-surgical care to, to undertake exercise. And then we're evaluating the effect of group exercise for those patients. And again, while there isn't PhD direct funding in there, the project has a lot of elements to it that could support uh, data collection by a PhD student. Okay, so that's just really a whistle stop of the type of research that's happening in terms of musculoskeletal disorders and aging within the faculty of EHS. I'm really, really interested in hearing from anyone who's interested in this topic. Please 
feel free to to drop me a line uh, and I can also um, reach out to my colleagues in the Ageing Research Centre if there are other colleagues to whom your question is better addressed. Best of luck and thank you.